Good evening, Canadian wine lovers, Carl's Wine Club members. Good evening. Welcome to a really special episode of Seller Confidential. What an exciting Thursday night. Mira Boucher, good evening. Good evening. And special guest, Sandra Oldfield. Special guest. No, this way, special guest. Sandra Oldfield, uh, joining us live from the Okanagan Valley. We are here in West Kelowna. We want to say good evening to all of you Canadian wine lovers across the country, especially you, Sandra. Good evening. How are you? I'm great. I'm, uh, yeah, I just had some wine. I'm coming down off of some wine and I'm ready, ready for hard questions tonight. You know what? I wasn't ready to get to the hard question. <laughs> But I'm sure that Mira dig pretty deep into the whole Sandra Oldfield biography. And she's, I'm sure that she down here has the hard yes. question. So, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just a wine guy here. I'm interested so, about your wine fashion. I am excited to just get to know you, Sandra. And I'm sure you have some stories up your sleeve. I've heard of one involving uh, ordering a gun online. Oh yeah, which I, I would love to know about at some point, but we're just so thrilled you're here because, I mean, most people and most of the club members, uh, Carl's Wine Club, would know you from uh, Tinhorn Creek as mm -hmm. the founder of Tim Tinhorn Creek. Um, but there's so many other things you've done for the industry over the years, like sub appellation uh, for for the south of uh, South Okanagan, like that was the first one down there, right? Yeah. There's, um, I think you started the Fortify Conference, if I'm not mistaken. One of the founders, you did, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And then um, one of Canada's top 100 most uh, influential women award, and just so many amazing things that have elevated the industry. So that if we look back when you started in the mid 90s to mm -hmm. now. This is a very different industry. So I am very excited to learn more about how that happened <laughs> from someone that was leading it, right? So yeah. Yeah. Well, so first I, and foremost, I met this ahead. guy. I met this guy. Okay. Yes. It always starts well, with that, when, right? when it starts well, like, yeah. <laughs> once upon a once upon a time. <laughs> I in California and I ended up moving to the Okanagan like uh, 1995. So that was a long time ago. You know what? Right there from the beginning, it starts already crazy. So, okay. To me, yes. So there's that legend is saying that you're hopping in 95, you're hopping into your 66 Mustang and yeah. you're bolting north to Canada, heading up, heading up to Oliver, BC. So, okay. How did you came to that decision because you're from Santa near Santa Rosa so to yeah. me with my background in international wines I did three trips to Sonoma County one of my absolute favorite place uh mm -hmm. how did you decide it and say I'm out of here and I'm heading up to Oliver BC yeah, I mean, you know, personal life always comes before work life. So I did meet this guy and I'm still married to him now. And I thought, I, you know, he told me when we were at UC Davis, I was studying winemaking uh, with a master's degree. He was studying viticulture for a master's degree. And um, he he led a tasting for the rest of the um, students in one of the first weeks. And, and I thought he was pouring, um, he was talking about Northern wine. So I thought he was from Oregon, to be honest with you. So I was like, Oh, wow, Northern wines, Oregon, like I'm never leaving um, California, but you know, I, I might move to Oregon someday. So I in my head, as I started dating him, I realized, like, somewhere a couple months in, he said the word Canada or something. I'm like, Yeah, aren't you from Oregon? And he's like, yeah, no, British Columbia. And I'm like, seriously, you're in Canada. They're making wine in Canada. So yeah, at some point, you know, the personal life overtakes the professional. But in this case, I felt, you know, like we wanted to get married. And I also had a great opportunity. I knew to come up to an area that at the time only had a, had about maybe 25 wineries in it. And, um, we had pretty big plans at that time with our partners for Tinhorn and, and 
I thought like, I'll never get this opportunity in Sonoma County to walk right out of a, a master's degree in winemaking right into a winemaker job. So um, it was the whole package was there, but and and not I'm I won't say anything against um, the East Coast, but I'm not an East Coast person. So, for example, if he had been starting a winery in like Ontario or somewhere in New York, I I probably wouldn't have probably wouldn't have married him and moved there. Like for me, I have to be happy with with the whole package. And for me, like the West Coast was still good. Yeah, yeah. So I, I looked up my. 66 Mustang, which I still own and I still drive and I drove it this summer. And um, I had like little house plants and on the way up, I stopped in Portland to give my um, my master's thesis presentation to a group of about 500, um, you know, really influential people in the wine industry, including Mandavi and all the rest were in the room. And uh, I had done my research at Mandavi and and I gave my research paper to the to the conference, and then I I kept driving north to to Canada. Yeah. That was one of the thing what it struck me when I was reading a little bit more about you. It's your connection with Robert Mondavi. Uh, did you had the chance to connect with him or with the personally, or is more more as a uh, no a little bit more no. of the on the outside? No, I was a I was a peon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they would never have noticed me in the hallway, that's for sure. So I I was funded by like seven or eight big wineries down there, like Simi, um, yeah. Beringer, Stag's Leap, you know, that's a real who's who. And they funded me to do a project on um, hard versus soft tannins for Cabernet Sauvignon. So why some vineyards give you more supple, velvety, soft, uh, smooth tannins and some other vineyards tend to give you the more angular sharp tannin. So it was a, it was a, a really cool research project that dealt with like um, different ripeness stages at two different vineyard blocks that were owned by Mandavi. And then we would make the wine. We made the wines at Mandavi, both commercially and in small lots. And then I worked with Ann Noble to um, characterize the tannins back at Davis. Um, you know, for me, Ann Noble is, is my mentor and, and she was, um, she's part of the reason why, well, I still talk to her all the time. She's, she's an amazing woman. Yeah. That is, that is really cool. Mira, I know it's not part of the line of a question, but I need to get back to that about the soft and hard then. And, uh, is it not more about what's happening in the winemaking or it's more about how you treat the vineyard that you come up with the two differences? Because to my understanding would have been in the wine, it's more in the winemaking more than in the vineyard. Yeah, well, what this was trying to show is that some people that have decades of working with all different ways of dealing with grapes in the vineyard, they were still finding, I'm sorry, in the winery, they were still finding that um, there was some real drastic differences from a vineyard perspective. And so, you know, they were kind of trying to see like, what is it, is there something in the vineyard that um, relates maybe on harvest pick date. So harvesting at a lower sugar content, an average sugar content or a late sugar content um, that um, ripens the, the um, tannins differently. And um, what's the difference between a vineyard block that is um, characterized as like harder tannins from one that's softer tannins. So, I mean, at the end of the day, there it was an initial study that after me, they ended up doing future and future research for the next 16 or 17 years. Like I still go back to some papers and they're still looking at the original research that was done in that year one with me. And so we found some um, trends that pointed to, um, you know, that pointed to, um, well, not to get too technical, but tannins are like, some of them are monomeric, which means that they're like single single molecules and so, and then of course tannins get longer and longer chains and so this was um something point to the fact there was something in like the ones that had like two or three stuck together that led to later research so it was just like an initial look to help lead them to future research in that area that is fascinating i know if we keep going down we mira is going to kill me 
And uh, <laughs> right away. That's my kind of stuff. I love, I love talking about that. So you hop in, you hopped in your 66, you drove all the way up here and you in Kent. And but when you got here, it's Tenorm was already on the go, or when you got here, you guys put everything together, found some partners. No, it was and bare land. No, sorry, it wasn't bare land, but about more than half of it was bare land, and I'd say about 18 acres of the 35 acres on where the winery sits was um was planted but um uh with some of it with hybrids and some of that was being sold to mission hill at the time some was being sold to um what's now our terra but at the time it was called brights um and then of course um the black sage um area where we owned 130 acres over there um, that was all bare land so it was pure you know putting the posts in because there was no people around us. I think even Burring Owl was just maybe a year behind after us, right? So all very new. Yeah. Is the guy the guy at Desert Hill were there already with the three Nobody boys in there? No, no, not yet. Not they, not over there. Like the only winery that was over there at the time was Burring Owl a, a couple years later. So um there was uh, um yeah. Harry McWaters had his vineyard there, which is now part of Phantom Creek. But there was no physical wineries over there, let alone not that much vineyard land. That's what I'm drinking tonight. Um, that's what I'm tasting. I have a Harry McWhorter uh, collection, uh, White Heritage, in my glass tonight. So, uh, yeah, another so part. You're a trailblazer, right? And he knew that black that black sage area had um, the best potential. And you know, we bought 130 acres over there, and then we, you know, we were making wine in a a building that was kind of like a, a a one bedroom house that has since burned to the ground on the property, but it was like a no floor drains. It, it, we gutted out the living room to put the barrels in. We gutted out the kitchen to make the lab. Um, oh. We got it, yeah. So it was super, super teeny tiny, yeah, yeah. But it's for you because you and Ken, though Ken in viticulture, you in winemaking. Your first assessment of the of let's see, not call it the golden mile at that point, but your first assessment of Oliver BC in terms of potential of grape, you guys were all over Merlot to start, all over. What was your first, like the first bread to say, okay, we go for this here? Yeah, I mean, that was all just part of the business plan because it was still pretty well, people didn't know what grew best where. So we knew that it was a warmer area. So we definitely knew we were going to focus on reds. But, you know, do you choose Noir? Do you choose Merlot? Do you choose Cab Sauv, Cab Franc? At the time, nobody else was growing any of that there. So the question was like, let's just do it on paper. What should work here, given degree days and ripening times? And that's why we chose Cab Franc, to be frank, is because it, it has a a quicker ripening time than Cab Sauv does in most years on the books, right? So not knowing anything different, we're like, let's plant some Noir, let's plant some Cab Franc, let's plant some Merlot, Pinot Gris, Chardonnay. I mean, we were originally supposed to plant Pinot Blanc. We ended up planting Diverse Traminer instead. So it was all, a lot of it was just on paper and what you think is going to work because there wasn't any of that down there at the time, right? Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. Now, like, you're getting in, it's like, oh, that guy grows a good X there. Let's grow X there too. But, but that wasn't happening back then. Yeah. Was there anything in this going on in the soyas, or that was only only in Oliver, I believe, right? I I can't. I honestly can't think of any vineyards that were like like anything substantial in a soyas at the time. Yeah. No. And the other thing that was the happening was like everything that was you know any of the wineries they were over on the Golden Mile bench and to be honest to you the main ones there at the time was um, Joe Bucinardo's winery which is now called Hester Creek and then Gary ah. was there right so for hey. me and then and there was also what's now Checkmate but at the time was um, Domain Combre and so as somebody coming up from California there was really those three wineries that were in alignment like literally in alignment with us on that bench and uh it was crazy because um, I have never in my life since met a more quintessential French winery than Domaine Cambrai. I've never in my life met a more quintessential um, 
Italian winery than Busnardo, than Joe Busnardo's Divino was. And then the same thing for Walter Garinger. He's like the quintessential German winery. And so the only three wineries there were like the full smorgasbord of, it, of Europe. And I was completely blown away. Yeah. By the diversity. Yeah. Wow. Mira, Mira, I, Mira, I get you the, the floor for the next five well, minutes. Well, I'm just reminiscing and thinking, Sandra, like tomorrow we're going to be driving down through those parts and picking up, what, 14 different Syrahs, because next week is International Syrah Day. Yeah. And uh, that's just a small part of it. I think we have, what, 25 in the lineup, 30? Yeah, 30 Syrahs in the lineup that we're going to open side by side next Wednesday night. So that's pretty that's pretty exciting. And a good at, that, at least dozen of them are down through that region. Yep. And yep. I think there's, what, over 300 wineries in BC now. So in yeah, 25, like 27 years, it's just exploded. So I want to know a little bit more about those growing pains. Like, I want to know at what point did you say, you know, we need a sub-appellation. Like, let's get organized or like... Yeah. You know, was well down the line. <laughs> I think the focus for me was all on our growth curve at the time because we had we owned 160 acres, but we were planting 30 to 40 acres a year in the early years. So every year we planted 30 to 40 acres. And so what was happening when I first started at age 28 or 28, 29, somewhere in there, as a new winemaker, we made a thousand cases in 1994. And then um, every year after that, it went a thousand cases, 3,000 cases, 5,000 cases, 15,000 cases, 25,000 cases, and then 40,000 cases. So in the first six to seven years, we, we went from 1,000 cases to 40,000 cases, which is psychotic. There's nothing, <laughs> nothing good about that growth curve. Nothing, nothing at all good about that. So, oh, um, yeah, it was an, an unbelievable. So I, I mean, I certainly didn't have my focus, I guess, so much on the industry at the time. I was like, just trying to, to, to run to keep up with what we were yeah. doing internally. But you know, all along there was a lot of discussions about VQA and national wine standards and, um you know, trying to, you know, how do we get into the European Union and um, should we have a taste panel? I mean, all the stuff that we still talk about half the time now. And so <laughs> I, I don't think really I was able to like step back and kind of see a bigger picture with things like, let's say, sub appellations until, you know, I'd say probably like, you know, 2010, you know, we, we have been in business at that point for like, 15 years or you know 13 years or something like that and then that to me was like okay um the industry is bigger it's 150 60 70 wineries at the time and you know we're starting to carve out different areas we know that the north okanagan is wildly different from the central and from the south and so for me it was like you know let's get this going because I can only imagine that this process for sub appellations is going to take a decade and it took about eight years. So I wasn't that far off. Yeah. Yeah. So, because yeah. like at 15 years of as 15 years, that's where the met the business was getting more mature. You guys, as you as operator of the business, you were more mature in the business sense. The business was more mature and the vines were more mature too. So yeah. at that at that stage, that's where you really started to understand what was underneath, right? Yeah, and I I mean, still to this day, I really feel like you know um, you never really understand that, anyways, because the more you know, the more you learn about your vineyards, be them young or old, um, the more you realize there's just so much more to learn about them. So, you know, uh, Mother Nature will throw a different curveball at you and you learn a bunch of new things about that vineyard block that you didn't know before. And so every year is just another um, addition to kind of like that database that you have going in your head about, you know, if we get a frost, like this area is going to do okay, this area is not. Or, you know, if we see leafhopper disease, you know, here's the, the fast way to deal with it, you know, like, it's just an, an ongoing process. And that's why everyone becomes so attached to their their little chunk of land that they farm. And they tend to think it's like the best piece of land ever. But just so that we all understand, every single person feels that their piece is the most special and unique. And 
<laughs> That's for sure. Hey, when did the when did the Syrah really make his appearance on the scene? Because if I'm if I look at the south of the Okanagan right now, I would say the the grape who has the most potential. To me, it's the Syrah. I yeah. know that was not the case a long time ago. So when did the Syrah made his appearance in the in the, for you guys came, became under your radar? Well, our first vintage for Syrah was 04, 2004. So I think we planted it around 2001. But, um, you know, there was Syrah in the, in the valley at the time when we moved in. That was at Nickel Vineyard. Um, they were the first Syrah in BC. And they were um, the, the standard bearer. They were the ones with, um, like, they were just making amazing Syrah there. And... Uh, and then, you know, I think I'm pretty sure Burrowing Owl was making a Syrah long before we were. Um, but I, I disagree with you in one sense. I mean, I agree that, you know, Syrahs are pretty awesome in BC and they're, they're very expressive. Um, I don't recommend people grow them, though, by the way. Um, they are not, um, they're not well suited for this environment right now. So, so I, I just like they're sexy. There's no issue with them, and and they 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 make great wines. But if I was consulting with a winery, um, you know, and they wanted to go pretty well all in on Syrah or or have it be a really large part of their portfolio, I would I would tell them that's a bad idea, because it's a very 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 risky grape to grow in the Okanagan. Um, a lot of the vine stock is virused. A lot of it has issues when it goes in the ground and it's also very susceptible to winter damage, even in the South, right? So um, I think the reason why you love Syrah so much is because you don't taste the bad ones. They get blended into other things. So you're really tasting some really awesome ones out there, but there's not a lot of it made, right? There's not like thousands and thousands of cases of Syrah. So you're tasting some really, handcrafted small amounts but is that a great idea for a wine industry eventually that's growing and people can never get their hands on it sure yeah yeah and we've heard that like we we, we know just as consumers that uh it's harder and harder for for winemakers to get their hands on good syrah grapes probably because yeah. of some of the things you're, you're mentioning the other thing we heard from a winemaker is that the way that they were planted at a certain point uh kind of made them more susceptible to certain things they were not um what was it the the way the root system was set up for some it's of them possible they were saying like i mean nowadays people are just trying to get more money out of their vineyard quickly and so they don't establish they don't take the time to establish properly with um for example you know, pruning it back in year two as if it looks like a one-year plant. Um, year three, maybe not even taking a crop off of it. Year four, starting to take a crop off of it. So that kind of investment, what that allows is that allows for that vine to really focus on a system. And the better the root system, really, it can come through some tricky um, frosts and some tricky... Um, cold winters and things like that. Whereas if you try and take the fruit off of it too quickly, get lots of growth on it and throw a lot of fertilizer on it, then quite often if you're hit with a bad winter, um, it won't survive it. So, you know, um, it's Syrah is just one of those varieties where, you know, if you want it to last and, and to be healthy, you have to take it a little bit slower in the establishment years. Yeah. But yeah, these are so not yeah, no, thank, thank you. Thank you. Because we were part of a conference last year and uh, we had that debate from the direct to consumer standpoint. What would you go to be the center part of a, of a of a new portfolio? And we had some viticulturist and winemaker. And I think from the viticulturist standpoint, there were a risky proposition. But Very for us on the on the direct to consumer, I think the demand for good, ripe, and uh, spicy Syrahs are inc is increasing across yeah. the country every year. So there is the uh, the direct to consumer uh, 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 opinion here, and that's why it was. Uh, but it's not only like the practices that you do with your Syrah 
for example, like, you know, we went to really reputable nurseries to get our rootstock and to get our vines when we planted. And, you know, everything looked great. Year three, you know, we're starting to get our small crop off of it. Year four, we're loving it. Year five, all of a sudden the leaves turn red and we've, you know, we've got a, a decline on that Syrah. They call it Syrah decline, right? So there you are um, having to replant a vineyard that you waited three weeks, you know, three years to get the first good crop off of, and now you're starting at scratch again. And that happened twice in that vineyard block. And I've talked with other wineries like Colmena and the rest. There's been lots of wineries that have seen the exact same, you know, five, six years later, they're having to replant it. So, you know, it's fine to say you love it from a consumer standpoint, but, you know, those wineries have to stay soluble and solvent in order to, to keep making that wine. And, that that that's not a great business plan if you keep planning something that you know struggles right so i'm not saying all syrah struggles i'm just saying um you have to look at it not just from a consumer point of view you have to actually grow what's right for the area as well for a reason that's that's the key isn't it and not jumping on a trend just because it's a trend just Absolutely. actually listening to what the ground it's telling you it can give you. <laughs> yeah. And if the trend is like, we love Syrah and we know we're always going to be paying big dollars for it in BC, then fine. Except the fact that any of these 30 Syrahs you're chasing next week, you know, there's not a tremendous amount of each one of those made, right? There's That's true. You know, a few acres of this, a few acres of this, not like thousands of cases of Syrah that any one, um, uh, any one uh, winery produces. So um, it's it's probably okay. Like the, the scarcity of it and the rareness of it keeps the price high as well. And, um, and then you don't have all your eggs in one basket. You can plant more of other things that grow well. I mean, there's no problem with that. I, I guess I just get worried when people come to me and say like, Syrah is hot, Syrah is awesome. You know, we're going to be a 5,000 case winery and we want 4,000 cases of it to be Syrah. And I'm thinking like that's super risky as a business. You may yeah. not survive. You may not survive that. And this is why we call it seller confidential, because <laughs> chatting with people like you, Sandra, who, uh, you know, you're a pioneer of the industry. You're not specifically tied and worried about the image of any particular winery like a lot of winemakers that we have when i was at kenhorn by the way oh, I, I amazing. Said, yeah yeah for right sure. but we're getting we're getting the real thing here we're getting the real opinions and i love it so this is uh this is great and so like so, i'm not down on it but like i said it's a holistic yeah. it's a holistic industry you have to you know you do have to look at things from a production standpoint and from a growing standpoint and from a consumer standpoint but then at the end of the day you also have to take a look at where you're physically at and does it make sense and oh. um yeah and, and the, the best cool. wines the best wines happen when you actually like have all that working together i think so, right? I think yeah. so. yeah because yeah. like Would it be, uh... also making something that just keeps failing on you right mm -hmm. Yeah. Would it be safe to say that probably in the south, the backbone of a very solid business plan will be Merlot? Well, for ours it was, but you know, um, Merlot also has its drawbacks. It, it is more susceptible to winter cold than say Cab Franc or Cab Sauv is, right? So again, uh, a lot of this is really site specific. Um, you know, in general, in the South Okanagan, you can grow reds, but there's absolutely low spots and frost spots and, um, you know, cold outflow spots where you shouldn't be growing it. Um, you know, for me, uh, if I had to pick an all around, um, well, again, everything has a little bit of a drawback and some positives. Merlot loves is, is quite good in the heat. So in the heat that we get in the summer, Merlot really, um, kind of response to that. But as soon as we start getting into the fall and the temperatures start dropping at night, Merlot kind of shuts down a bit, right? And it's like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of gonna struggle to give you this last bit of sugar and ripeness. But Cab Franc's exactly the opposite. If it gets above 35 C in the summer, it, it really doesn't like it. It's It kind of shuts down a bit. But then as you start getting into those really important days of ripening in early October, as soon as the temperature drops, Cab Franc's like, yeah, bring it on. We love the cool. 
right? And it just excels. So again, they all have their little patterns and, and you really want to try and match some of that up with your site, right? Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So, so we so hung our hat on Merlot, no getting around it. We, we absolutely did because it was an early, early ripener for reds. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And so, so we've heard about the crazy growth, right? Going from 1,000 cases right. a year to what did you say, 40,000 or how many? 40,000. It was stupid. Wow. <laughs> that's a lot of growth. Huge that's success. a lot of growth for 29. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At what point did you say, you know, maybe we should sell our wines direct to consumer? Like, tell us more about that. Because I'm pretty sure you started the first wine club yeah. in C for sure. And yeah, for, I think I'd say that it, it was born out of government um, restrictions initially because initially in the olden days, back in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, even the U.S. wasn't doing wine clubs that much. So wine club really wasn't a thing. But what we wanted to be able to do was like, oh, you bought a case of our wine. We're going to give you a 10 percent discount. And that was illegal back then. Um, you couldn't huh. discount. You couldn't discount at the register. Right. Huh. And so what we what we. Uh, what I and my husband and, and our partners decided was, well, let's read the law again. The law was like, once it's in the bottle and you're selling it out your front door, you couldn't discount it. Hmm. So we're like, we still want to promote people buying our wine by the case. So we'll discount it when it's in the barrel. So that's what started us mm -hmm. out with features, right? Was um, taking the California way of people tasting the wine out of the barrel before mm -hmm. it's bottled, committing to us with dollars and doing a futures program. And the government was like, you can't, oh yeah, you can do that, I guess. Like, they were like <laughs> we found the loophole. <laughs> we found the loophole. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we ended up um, doing, I would not call that a wine club. It was a, fut a Merlot futures mm -hmm. program that we had, but it built a lot of um, case buyers at Tinhorn so that by the time they changed the rules and allowed for um, discounting at the register and all the rest. And then of course the U S was really going pretty big at that point on wine clubs. We we're like, let's migrate our futures into a wine club. And so we started the, you know, as far as I could tell was the first wine club in, in British Columbia at the time. So, yeah. And so, back in that, so at that time, was there anyone outside of BC who were purchasing direct to consumer? I was like, or, let's say 80% BC and a little bit of trickling down uh, Alberta and a little bit outside of that, or what was we the, just, the jail? We just, in our wine club, when we started, it, it was just like free for all. Like if you're in Alberta, we'll send it to you. It was all good. Right. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, probably at the time for us, maybe 80% of our sales were in BC and 20% were in Alberta. And so our wine club was almost the same makeup. Like if, Mm -hmm. If they came into our door and they heard about a wine club and 20% of those people were from Alberta, we had rel relatively a similar percentage was from Alberta. So it wasn't until, you know, a few years into this where we started appearing on, you know, the radar of what we mm -hmm. now know as free my grapes and all the rest. But to be honest, in the mm -hmm. early days, as, as is the case today, we were just like, yeah, we're good. Like, if you want to buy our wine, just, yeah, we'll ship it to you. It's all good. So we shipped, you know, all across the country pretty well right from the get go. And and up until the day when Tinhorn sold, we were still basically just doing whatever we want, was selling wherever we wanted. Nice. Yeah. So speaking of free my grapes, right? So this is one of the stories I'm dying to hear about. And if you've got other wild ones like this, Sandra, please. The cone oh, of the silence is around us. The seller confidential. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I heard that at one point, maybe 10 years ago, uh, you were advocating around, you know, removing some of the crazy restrictions interprovincially for, for sending out wines direct to consumer. And to make a point, you did something a little wild, didn't you? Yeah, well, I mean, it was just kind of obvious because like the U.S. had already... It was around the time, I think, you know, the U.S. had the same laws. So this is not unique to Canada. We both went through prohibition laws and all the rest. But they had had a Supreme Court um, case that basically um, got rid of that. So we were kind of like all poised for that same thing to happen in 
Canada, but it never did. And so we tried the political, you know, you can try the legislative angle with the Supreme Court, which we ended up doing. But first, we tried the political angle um, with Free My Grapes with, um, you know, allowing the um, parliament in Ottawa to basically, um, you know, open it up to everybody. So we we're kind of in that that mode. I mean, I think, you know, we had like Terry David Mulligan who did the, you know, that illegal walk across the line with two cases of of mixed BC wines when he like literally walked across the the border to Alberta and, you know, come arrest me type of thing. Like it was those kind of days where we're just trying to make a point. So um, you know, I, I really appreciated Terry David Mulligan doing that at the time. For me, I think I was sitting in a hotel room at, at the, I think I was at the Listel um, in Vancouver. And uh, I was a little frustrated one night. And, and I, I seem to remember sending an email off to Anthony Gismondi and saying, you know, hey, um, I'm thinking of just like buying a shotgun um, from, <laughs> uh, I don't know, somewhere, somewhere in Canada and just like proving a point that I can buy a shotgun and have it shipped direct to my door, but I can't, you know, legally do that with wine. And he was like, that'll be good. <laughs> do that. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I've actually never told anyone that it was actually um, Tony Gizmondi that I talked with first about this. And then, so, I mean, I, it's not like I ran it past my husband or our partners or anything. I, I literally just went online that night at the Listel and um, look, looked up, you know, shotguns in Canada online. And I found a place, I think it was um, Saskatchewan and it was some, yeah. some kind of shotgun. I don't know. I don't, I don't shoot guns, but I'm, I'm okay with people. <laughs> um, I just asked if I could uh, buy it online. They told me um, as long as I had a PAL license. So I went to a neighbor of mine who had a PAL license and turns out, you know, it got delivered to him because he has the PAL license, but I paid for it with my credit card. Right. So um, when it arrived, I was really excited and um, I, I had pre-told a bunch of media people about it. So all of a sudden I had like, you know, global news and CBC was at my door, like, um, wanting the picture of me holding onto a shotgun. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I, I, I wrote a blog post about it at the time because I, you know, it still really is true actually to this day that you can buy you know, that you can buy a 12 gauge and not 12, 12 bottle case, right? Legally across. Yeah. The especially a mixed case because yeah. we have members all the time saying, couldn't we do an advent calendar with all 24 mixed yeah. cases? Of, we'll get there. We'll get there. You know, and right now that's not, it's not really possible. But at the time, even you couldn't even get it from, um, you know, you couldn't even get you know, we couldn't ship to Alberta at the time because even though we had won that um, Bill um, C-311 in the legislature, um, we it was like legal in Alberta prior to that day. And then when that bill passed, Alberta made it illegal. So it was actually, it became a province by province issue. A step back um, almost. <laughs> yeah, it was a step backwards. So, I mean, yeah. my, you know, I, I feel we'll get there eventually, but, you know, for me, I'm, I just really, um, you know, I just had, I'm a big health and safety person. I just had a real issue that I could buy a shotgun online, but I couldn't, you know, people can do the same from us with, you know, with what I consider to be, you know, a normal beverage that you enjoy with your meal. Right. So, you know, totally. I, yeah. and I love it. Cause I read your blog post on that. I thought that was a wild story and just so smart and such a great way to to illustrate yeah, I point. always left Tony Gizmondi out of that, but fair enough. It was, it was definitely <laughs> a slight collusion with him on that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and like, um, one of the funny things that you were comparing is that with, uh, with the gun, you cannot have it labeled a gun. That was one of the weird rules that was there. And you're like, that's my yeah. favorite. <laughs> but I love the fact that they could use Canada post, right? Like it was just right. right from Canada Post, which I was like, again, at the time, we had to use like other shippers to get our wine across the border because Canada Post, you know, it, it was the whole thing was a little bit crazy that I mean, cut cut forward to today. I'm not at my house tonight. But if I was, 
if I wasn't my house tonight, I would have to go downstairs, but I could show you that gun. I still own it. Right. And so <laughs> what I, I had decided to do many years ago, and I, you can still hold me to this, but you know, in the years where we were had the Vancouver International Wine Festival, which is such an awesome event, and we'll we'll get back to that again at some point. But I've always told the wine festival that um, if we, if it is ever opened up across our country, that you can buy wine direct to consumer without restrictions in all the provinces, that I would donate that gun with a ton of wine associated with it to their silent auction, so or to their live auction to raise money. Oh, so, yes. You know, for that me, is I'm legend. Waiting. I'm waiting for to, the time when I can put that gun up for auction. It still hasn't happened yet. I have you know, never Sandra, a gun in my life, but I might want to buy that one. <laughs> yeah, Sandra, I have some great memories, uh, great memories of the Playhouse uh, in Vancouver. Uh, back in the day, the agency that was distributing your wine uh, with Trialto, and Richard Dittmark and Cam Nicholson. And these guys took me to the Playhouse two or three, three or four years in a row. Yeah. Um, and yeah, these are, uh, yeah, these were wild time back yeah, um, before, before we had a family and all that. There was a, yeah, there was a, a fun wild time, I remember. Yeah, and I still, I still actually sit on a board today with Richard Dittmar, so I see him still pretty frequently. But yeah, I mean, they were, you know, the the Playhouse, what I still call the Playhouse. We know it's not, but um, the wine festival is great. Like it, it, it's always such a great event, and for me, now just being able to attend, attend it, um, and see it from other people's side is is even better for me. It's a lot of stress when you're pouring at it, but um, you know, I. You know, I, I, I do kind of miss that um, auction that they have going there. I thought, you know, the, the black tie auction was such a special event and I, I hope we can get back to it soon. Yeah, absolutely. They raise a boatload of money with uh, with this beautiful auction and the prices that people were donating from all over the world. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yeah, so I was actually, I was, I bought a few things that I, like, I couldn't really afford, and I, I all of a sudden would see my paddle go up, and I was like, wow, I think I own that thing now, and I'm totally screwed. And uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I'm not really allowed to bid anymore uh, at that auction, but I will tell you the one thing I bought once. At the, la the last thing I bought, which was why I was cut off, was um, I bought like a, a yacht. But it <laughs> wow, <laughs> it wasn't actually like Whoa. the whole yacht. But well, I got the whole yacht for a party for a night. It was like a party. Oh, yacht. okay. So like, buy, buy the yacht, and then you have a big party on it. And uh, yeah, it costs a lot nice. of money. And uh, I ended up not being able to to use it. Um, I, yeah. And I ended up re-donating it back in. So hence the reason why I don't go to live auctions anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I just can't <laughs> picture cans like you did what? Yeah. It was, it was not a good day. That was not a good day. In my life. <laughs> Sandra, if you drink wine, what that, if it's not BC wine, which kind of wine is on the table uh, for dinner when you host people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I love, I like all wine, honestly. So um, although obviously mo a lot of our seller is BC wine, I'm, you know, I love, um, I just love so many wines from so many areas. I, I'll give you an example. I love old Chardonnays from California, like really aged 20 year old Chardonnays. I love, you know, one of my favorite wines is, um, you know, um, Alsatian Rieslings. And I'm, I'm really big on a lot of white wines. Um, I love, uh, I love really quirky wines from odd places that I've never been to before that I get to a little insight into that, that country through that glass of wine. So, you know, Russian wines I've had, I, you know, I, I've had, um, you know, I had, a, I think I had a wine in Thailand of all places. Like I just, I, I just love wines for sure. But to be honest with you, we don't get a, a massively great selection here in, in Canada. You, you know, you, you will get a lot more of the mass produced stuff and um, you know, you really have to be in that country that you're at to, to really appreciate the really handcrafted ones. Same way with people coming here. Right. 
right? Absolutely. So, you, know, yeah, yeah. you know what's at the Vancouver airport is not representative of of the artisan wines that we make here in BC, right? Yeah. Do you have any good uh, do you have any good experience with Ontario wines? Oh, all the time. Like I've been a big fan of Ontario wines for a long time. I mean, again, like for me, this the standard Riesling is is still, you know, I can't get past their Rieslings there. I tend to like fall fall in love with their Rieslings and then they want to pour me more things. I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm just going to hang on to this Riesling for the next little while and drink it. So yeah. I'm still a huge just believer that that is that is what I love the most from Ontario. But, um, you know, obviously they make, you know, for me, I think they really excel at Cab Francs and Chardonnays as well. Those those would be my my top. Mira has a pretty cool uh, uh, Riesling in her glass from Ontario right now. Yes. And it's, yeah, 2015 Pearl Morissette uh, Black Balls. Black Balls. Nice. I've yeah. got 2022 tap water from the sink tonight. <laughs> Penticton. Penticton Appalachian. Penticton right? sink. Penticton <laughs> sink. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Do you know about these guys, the Black Ball Riesling? I don't. Kind Promo of. Uh, yeah, Promo said they have cool. a pretty cool story. I think the reason they call it Black Ball is because they fa they failed the VQA on this so many freaking times. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it was so freaking good that they the tasters from the LCBO had no idea what it was. Yeah. I mean, that's still an issue out here. I mean, um, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's still an issue out here. I would say, um, you know, for a winery like that, I'd say get over it because honestly, well, they did. everybody's failed all the time, all the wines, like it just but, happened. Right. But so, the point being, yeah. okay, there was, there was the kind of inherent, I would call it almost corruption in the whole system where you got the sellers and buyers of the wines who are one, how can there be corruption with a monopoly? I don't understand your point. Right? I know. Um, <laughs> it works out in their favor because now it's like a cult wine. And now I, I think they're at the point where they don't they don't go for VQA anyway because they don't need it because yeah. they sell out of it all the time, right? But here's how I feel about like that. Because you know, honestly, they're super Tuscans and they they're they're cool because they're out, right? Like I'd rather be cool because I'm in. So I mean, I would rather I would rather like get rid of taste panels, let the public decide but also like not feel like you have to be a renegade and out of it in mm. order in order to be awesome because I'm a player I'm a joiner and and I believe that um when when you're in it it helps float all boats higher right so for me um anyone can be not a joiner and um and be seen as like edgy but it takes real it takes real work to be a joiner and someone who's trying to bring the industry together mm -hmm. and be edgy. And that that's yeah. the people I have respect for. So for me, I'd rather see the taste panel go away if there's a problem with the taste panel. That to me and is that's what and right? that's what they did. They went on the they tried five times. They paid for five trials. And you pay a few hundred bucks each time, I think, yeah. right? They paid for it. They all failed. The lab results were perfect. Yeah. The tasters did just, just didn't. Yeah, that, to me, that's where the problem started is where the, the lab tests, it comes out clean out of the lab and it doesn't go to the panel. That's where I'm like, okay, now we're talking about opinion here. That's where it's like, yeah, I, I see yeah, that. And, you know, the, and let's face it, like the lab doesn't tell you if you're going to like it or not. And obviously the LCBO has a lot more money. So they, they do a lot more lab testing than BC does, but um, you know, we had a, a joke. I mean, we could never get our Gewurztraminer Germainer to pass ever, ever, ever. I mean, ever, every year it never passed. And it was our, one of our most popular wines. We made 7,000 cases of Gewurztraminer Germainer a year and it would be gone within, you know, eight months of release, eight, nine months. Right. So, but we could never, ever get it to pass VQA. So, you know, what I what I learned is um, with the Gewurz was we we just did what I would call Mustang aging. So I would um, in in those middle years when we couldn't get it to pass, I would just throw the case, a case of wine into the trunk of my Mustang, my 66 Mustang. I just drive around with it for a month and it would get hot and cold and bounced over and beat up. And then we put those bottles into VQA and it was like, ah, oh, it passed. Right. Because they were just like, it's not, 
aged enough or it wasn't, it just hadn't come together. <laughs> so we would just oh, like man. hyper age it. Oh, by the way, that's illegal. Just so you know, because it's supposed to be the same wine that people buy off the shelf. But anyway, we would just Mustang trunk age our, our, um, Gewurz every year and it would always pass, but you have to learn tricks like that. Right. And why should there be tricks like that? The answer is just get rid of the taste, taste panel. Right. That's it. Plain and freaking simple. Yeah, oh my God. Know. Well, that's a helpful hint for wineries. Like if you can't get your wine to pass, just throw it, throw a case in a really rickety car and drive around with it for a month and you're good to go. And I think and what suggested month is what July and, and or August. <laughs> no, we were always doing it in like, it was early, like, cause we would release this thing in May usually. So it was like, <laughs> April, you know, a March or April thing. It was just, yeah. It was, oh, you know, that's amazing. I can say these things cause I don't care anymore. So it's all good. <laughs> well, that's why so, it's seller confidential. That's what I was trying to get at. Is you know we're getting the real juicy tidbits here. This is so crazy. now, so now that you, like now that you're completely out of all of that. So what are you up to lately? What's what Sandra Oldfield days are uh, are filled with? Well, I still do a lot of work for the wine industry, but not just the wine industry. But I will I will tell you, like being a winemaker was a real honor for me, a real privilege. I. I was fine um, hiring my replacement at Tinhorn about six years before the winery sold and stepping into the CEO role. I thought um, that was not going to be good for me, but pretty quickly I realized that like my, I feel my real talent is um, mentoring people. And so, you know, I, I really like to see businesses succeed and treat their employees properly. And so it's kind of, that's what I do now. I, I go to companies and, I help find solutions for them to how can we how can we find a way so that you know you're treating your employees with respect and the employees are giving you their all and there's a a really great relationship there. Um, I I don't know how long I'll be doing that for because at some point I'll probably move into you know I'll be in something else. But for right now. That's that's what really excites me is um, trying to find solutions for companies, not just wineries, but, you know, companies that are really struggling with the hardest part of their business. And to be honest with you, the hardest part of your business is always your people. And it doesn't really matter what business you're in. It's always the people. And so it's not that people are hard. It's like learning how to manage them properly is hard. And so, um, you know, this is my sixth Zoom call today because um, that's what I did Gosh. from 7, 7.30 this morning till till six tonight. I was on, you know, I hosted a webinar for Fortify on mental health um, and, you know, how to, how to deal with your employees that are having mental health issues. I dealt with, um, you know, the tourism industry, I'm pretty well heavily into the tourism industry right now as well. So, you know, and I, I'm dealing with clients um, that are basically, um, you know, asking for help on that kind of stuff. But on the side of my plate, I do a lot of work with sub appellations. Still, I, I get called on when a new area wants to form a sub appellation and um, they just want uh, it's the process streamlined. And now I've done like four of those. And so I'm getting a lot of calls for, um, you know, people that are exploring that idea in BC as well. Yeah. Who is working on their one? I heard through the grapevines that East Kelowna are putting some stuff together. Is it, uh, is it East crazy? Kelowna's, I'm not working on that one, but I work with the guy who does the science on that. They, they are definitely, I mean, we finished the process for Lake Country, but I, the only thing that's, um, I, I'm not totally sure it's happened yet because we're still waiting for the legislature to meet and approve it in Victoria, right? So that one, that process is pretty well done and just waiting for the it to go through. We're, you know, we're working on other areas in the South Okanagan, you know, Black Sage, areas like that. So, um, you know, there's not a tremendous amount of them out there and it's not something I work on um, like daily or weekly or even monthly because it's a, a relatively slow process. But, um, you know, I, I know, I do know how to streamline that, that now with, um, you know, trying to, it's its a really hard thing to draw a line around an, a region, not just because, um, yeah, because every, some people are inside that line and some people are not. And that, that's uh, it, right? You're talking about with the people from the Skaha when everything happened around the Skaha. Yeah. 
like, like the, like, like who's in, who's out. This is like yeah. you have to cut it, cut it somehow, somewhere. And there's always, you mentioned, there's always someone on the outside, and right. it's uh, you can't please everyone. No, and you know, I've not ever been, you know, uh, I don't really think of myself as a very um, politically correct person, to be honest. But <laughs> I will tell you that in these processes, I'm pretty good at. Um, seeing all points of view. And again, I, I think that kind of has helped me in my current role now of, you know, I, I'm really trying to help employers see the employee's point of view and vice versa. I can speak both really well to both sides of that. And and I think that kind of like those negotiations that happen with sub appellations, I, you know, I, I really see validity in everybody's point. But at the end of the day, if you want to move forward, we have to move forward with something. And now how can we how can we make that tenable for everybody and, and find that the best solution for the, the most amount of people? Right. Yeah. Sounds like your next row should be in politics for God's sake. Yeah, I was approached to be a, <laughs> to be a, an MP. It went, went Tin horn sold. Yeah. I won't tell you yeah. for what party, but it was the wrong party. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I was like, yeah, no, I'm never, I'm not doing that. And I was pretty clear on my blog post when um, our partner sold Tinhorn that I'm not going into politics ever. That was one of my one of my three things at the end of that blog post was like, I'm not going into politics. So, yeah, that's not for me at all. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Mira, Mira, I know. We like hanging out with you and having these seller confidential chats, which if you went into politics, you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to do as much. Right. So, yeah. And all of a sudden I, <laughs> I love it. I, you know, I'd be saying, you know, I'd I'd have to be self censoring myself again. Exactly. That's not working. Yeah. Anymore. <laughs> I had not to working. censor myself at Tinhorn a long time, and and I'm yeah, I'm good not doing that now. So yeah. Perfect. I have to say, speaking about uh, about uh, your winemaking career, uh, I tasted the 2012 Chardonnay that you made. Uh, mm -hmm. This wine was like I'm I'm really 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 passionate about Chardonnay. I love Chardonnay from all over the world and that 12 hit every chord on Good. my I, I, yeah it was absolutely spectacular and to this day it's still shining. It's Good. bright like 10 years later it's bright it's uh, it's Chardonnay at its core and it's very well made. Well Good. done. I didn't I didn't make that we made that. And that was at the time probably 30, 30 people from our bookkeeper to our tasting room manager to our, you know, to me, it's an hour wine. It's always an hour wine. So I'm always fairly offended when a winemaker uses the words my wine. It just is like nails on a chalkboard to me because it takes everybody at that winery to make that wine. So I, I super appreciate that all because I'm sitting here tonight. I'll say I'll. I'll take the thank you for that, but know that 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 was not my wine. That was our wine. Yeah. And so, Sandra, I have a question for you about that, because I've been thinking a lot about culture and terroir. And <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, we I think it was one of these seller confidentials, Carl. We had Mark Simpson on and he's kind of a one man show winemaker. Right. And he makes some great wines. And he said, you know, what people often don't realize is that terroir. Sure, it's the dirt it's the climate, it's all these things, but it's also the winemaker. It's like oh, who yeah. makes the wine and it's yeah. the talent behind it. And so he's one man show, but I'd like to extend that. Like it's all the people, right? It's the vineyard manager. It's, it's the person at reception. It's everybody. Right. And that brings me, what's that? A hundred percent. hundred percent. Right. And that brings me down to, and that's why I love wine because I feel like you get a glimpse, not just into their climate there, but you get a glimpse into the real culture of like how people do things. And there's culture, you know, as for countries, different countries have different wine styles because their country's culture is different. They eat different things. They, they pair their wines with different things, but it's also, um, you know, on the micro level of the winery. And that's yeah. what I want to ask you about is, you know, we worked with what 80 wineries fairly closely in the last couple of years, Carl and I, and we can sense right away what the culture of that, that winery is about. Well, I can too. Right. <laughs> Almost. Like, and there's, like, there's been a few where I'm like, I don't want to touch that winery with a 10 foot pole because I can smell the culture from here and I don't like it. Uh, <laughs> and then there's, the ones we work with are the ones where it's like, okay, they have a great culture. They're fun. 
They, mm -hmm. you know, they're all different and we want to work with them. And I, I taste it in the wine, frankly. I enjoy the yeah, wine. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You can taste, you can taste it in the wine in a sense, but even if you can't, the answer is there is no such thing as a one man or a one woman show mm -hmm. in the wine industry. I've yet to find anybody who can um, bottle a thousand cases solo on a bottling line. So I have to remind wineries quite often that even if you're literally the only employee there, you're still bringing in part time people all the time to get the work done. So don't, aren't they important? Aren't they? Important? And there's a culture with that. You build a culture of how you do things, yeah. right? And what your values are. And that's why wine is a communal thing from day one, from thousands of years ago. Just yeah, like what you right now, because quirky wines, like a winemaker can make a quirky wine. And holy, if you don't have the right people selling that wine in your tasting room, you'll never sell it. And so, really, was it a great wine or not? If it's still sitting on the shelf and not in people's bellies right so yeah um, if you're team didn't well, buy it exactly and if if they can't learn how to sell quirky wines and stuff like and and again like that team's only as happy as getting a paycheck and you know and that might be you know an accounts receivable or or payable person or like that's why i'm saying like it's it's so to me very offensive in a sense when people are like um you know we love your wine or or Worse yet, the 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 um the winemaker says, you know, my wine is dot dot dot, and I'm like, hey, I know all the people behind you, they're just staying quiet right now because you have a big ego. But I have to tell you, like, there's a lot of people behind that wine that you're saying is your wine, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's actually winemaking is a leadership exercise, isn't it? And that's why for me it moved right. That's why I could easily pivot and move right into what I'm doing now is because, um, you know, if you drink that Kool-Aid a lot, if you really believe that um, wines are made by everybody in that organization, you start understanding that, you know, your terroir is great, the, the, the weather is great, um, you know, all those things have an influence, but at the end of the day, um, everybody else makes up that terroir. They make up that you know what you're seeing in the glass for sure and it's not a one it's never a one man show it's definitely not a one man show it's sometimes a one woman show and even that's wrong but you know we'll just go with that. <laughs> hey sandra oh we're running out of time i don't want to keep you too long because you're you're busy but i'm not letting you go until you tell me how did you make a decision to go 100 percent twist cap because you were the first one to have that vision and for me, it is a, it was a tremendous step forward into the Canadian, into the world wine industry. It was beyond our border. It's international. So when did you make that decision and what pushed you to be such a visionary at the, on that front? So that was, um, that would be our business partner. Um, that, that was um, the major partner in Tinhorn. He really wanted um, us to explore that idea. He was getting tired of opening up corked wines in a cellar. And I will tell you around 99, 2000, there was a lot of really bad corks out there. Like, you know, the cork industry had not come nearly as far as it is now. So um, I was game for it. We knew it was gonna be good for all the whites because we had seen what had happened in Australia at the time. And we knew that whites were kind of going to be a slam dunk. So we decided to go with our, what we were hoping was going to be our longest aging red wine. And if it worked with that, we felt it would work with everything else. So we chose at the time, our, our reserve Merlot was the only reserve wine we were making at the time. It was called Old Field Collection. And, um, and we, um, yeah. And so we were the first to um, use the screw top and, um, and then um, we were like the second to release it because we aged it for about almost two years, about a year and a half in the bottle before we released it. And um, and for us, um, the only reason why it succeeded is because we had a lot of support given to us by the wine writers in British Columbia. It, 
mm -hmm. in particular, there was seven or eight really big wine writers that really wanted to see this happen. And when they heard that we were bottling with it, they were going to be on board with it. They were going to give us more love as the first wine that did it. You know, I have to say, like, if sales had plummeted and, and you know, it had been super risky, we may have pulled back. But because they were there you know, telling the public, this is the way of the future. This is what we should be doing. We um, really tipped our hat to those wine writers. And they then, because they were giving us so much love with press and, you know, telling restaurants they needed to buy us and all the rest. And um, then we just, the next year, we converted our entire bottling line over to only screw top. We couldn't even do cork at that point. So we, we sold our um, bottling line to Oregon. Um, Idaho, I think. And we got in one that only did screw top and then we were fully committed. Um, and, you know, we couldn't have done that had the wine writers in BC not, not supported us the way they did. And at that point, then, you know, then you get traction. Right. But, um, but I, I find that to be probably one of the, the best things I ever um, implemented at Tinhorn because I, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of phone calls with, wineries from um, Australia figuring out the real technical how to do it right because we knew if we were going to be first we had to do it right and uh, mm. pretty proud of that I walk into a store now and I see you know 40 percent you know of the reds even and more than 50 percent closer to 60 to 70 percent of the whites now have screw tops on them and and I feel pretty proud of that because you know, the only negative to that is like my 11 year old daughter could then open up a bottle of wine without my permission. <laughs> that was really the only issue with it. Other than that, it was all good. There was all, there was all good things with screw top. So, yeah. Amazing. And that was 2003 that you'd bottled your Merlot Reserve? No, it was, it was the 2001 was the first vintage that we did of that. And we did um, a few hundred bottles of um cork and screw top and then we marketed them together in a two pack box with mm. the cork was face down and the screw top was up and you couldn't buy one without the other you had to buy them as the experiment and, yeah. and we visually did it that way to show people that in your cellar you don't need to be laying these down they can be standing up or they can be upside down or however you want so the cork yeah. was upside down in the two bottle box and the screw top was right side up yeah and that was That's brilliant. That was an idea from Roger Bolton down at UC Davis. So again, I have to tip my hat to him because he was like, hey, you should do a two bottle box and show people visually that they don't need to to put the cork, you know, they don't need to put the screw top um, laying down, right? Down, laying down, yeah. That is brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We, tasted, we tasted a 2003 Old Field Reserve Merlot yep. just this last summer. I remember it was like 45 degrees on the beach and we had a big ice pack around it so it wouldn't cook. It was um, when we, that was a soft wine when we released it. I'm assuming it's over the hill by now, but it was a pretty was, soft year when we it released it. It was spectacular. Good. Awesome. Andrew. I called it the 95 point experience. I don't have any. Anyway. Of I didn't get any of that when uh, Tin Horn sold, so I'll have to rely on you. Uh, yeah, to, to it was soft. It was silky. Uh, the... Uh, the oxidation was just like, like to me, it felt like it was like twelve years old. It was that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, it was that it preserved beautifully. It was amazing. I still had the first bottle off the line um, from the first vintage, which would be the first screw top Canadian made wine. I have that in my cellar still. I haven't opened that one yet. Wow. Wow. There might be one you never open. I don't know. No, I'll, just, pro I'll probably get drunk and open it one night and forget that I opened <laughs> it. <one. laughs> Make sure Shalan wears the bee costume that night. <laughs> Make sure you call <laughs> us right, right now. She's Tell trying us. to make me laugh, but yeah, she's in front of me trying to make me laugh right now, so it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sandra, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been great following your career. It's been great to, to connect with you. And thank you for being so generous of uh, your knowledge. Yeah, no worries. I really appreciate your open, open questions. It's really a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Sandra, that was amazing. Oh my goodness. Bye. We should make sure that we get together at some point and bring some great Chardonnays from around the world. 
Oh, yeah. Yes. If you come to my mm -hmm. house, you can hold my shotgun. So feel free. Yes. <laughs> <We're there. laughs> That's awesome. Thanks, Thank, you, Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. Amazing. Holy cow. That was so cool. Uh, I've been thinking of that uh, for a couple weeks now. So, wow, that was amazing. Love, love. Uh, yeah, love the authenticity, the knowledge, and uh, the generosity of uh, of Sandra Oldfield. So, uh, yeah, here we are for another uh, amazing Southern Confidential. Yes, that was a lot of fun. Thank you guys so much for joining us. It's so much more fun when we know that you're hearing these stories um, and uh, there to laugh with us. It's fantastic. And what's coming up, Carl Boucher? We got a crazy day tomorrow going around the Okanagan and picking up like 20 plus Syrahs. We got some from out east coming. Yeah. So, so right. we have like right now, I think we have already 12 to 14 bottles already arrived. Tomorrow, we're going on the road for another 15 or 16, and there's still a bunch on in the mail to be arrived. So, And I haven't counted the international one that we're going to have to throw in the lineup. I have a bunch of winemakers lined up from all over the country who's going to join us as well. But tomorrow, Mira, it's going to be a real fun day, uh, stopping winery to winery, saying hi to, just like Sandro is mentioning, you know what? Like, like tasting room people are so to me. Like, it's so much fun to say hi to these great people who tell the story of the wine. Sometimes just the grabbing the winemaker when they're doing punch down or like solo work, and we're we ending up we're having so many great conversations. So tomorrow is going to be a heck of. I'm looking forward to that. I think I've been buzzing in your ear for now three weeks now. I can't wait for Friday, and tomorrow it's Friday. We're hitting the road. Yeah, and, uh, you, you might up. see us. You might see us go live very briefly if there's something outrageously cool that crops up along the way. Because I know that some some of the winemakers know that we're stopping by, and uh, one in particular said she's got a surprise for us. So we'll see. Can't wait. That'd so uh, Canadian wine lovers, Carl's Wine Club members, Mira Boucher, all of you guys <laughs> across the country. Thanks for tuning in. It was a heck of an evening. I'm like, I'm filled. I'm filled with that uh, generosity of knowledge and I feel good about what we do. And I'm glad that we had a good audience tonight to listen to uh, Sandra Oldfield, founder of Tinhorn Creek Winery and still very involved into our uh, great Canadian wine industry. Amazing. Thank you so Thank much, you. guys. Have a great I'm, night. Have a good night.